If you want Colts talk all year long, you're in the right place. Fires it upfield, caught over the middle, Michael Pittman Jr., there he goes! He's at the 40, he's at the 30, slips out of a tackle, 20, 10, 5, touchdown! Michael Pittman Jr. takes it 75 yards to the house! Big run, angling left, 40, he's at the 30, down the near sideline, 20, 50, 10, 5, touchdown! Jonathan Taylor, a 49-yard gallop to Peter. In the Indiana Union Construction Industry Radio Studio, let's get the podcast started. Welcome into the official Colts podcast. My name's Jeffrey Gorman. J.J. Stankovitz is here, and I'm going to stick with you for a second. What kind of socks, uh, what's your sock game today? Because I was looking at Yeah, what do oh, you... Uh, it's their uh, kicking stigma. How socks. about that? Boy, company man right here. You really here. need I to kick, that. though, when you... Yeah, you need to kick socks. when you come yeah, out there. I, don't know. I did. I did a workout class on Monday, and my hamstrings are on fire, so I actually what, don't think I could. Kick. What time of the day was that workout 6 class? A.m. How about that? Six a.m. He said that the other day. I was yeah. like, "Good for you." He yeah. had his own little period there. Rise and thrive. What is it? Right. Yeah, yeah. Rise, yeah, Rise and Thrive is the name of the class. It's good. It, yeah. See, uh, the only time I can go where my kids aren't um, uh, awake. Any triathlons possibly in your future? Let's no, no, just not enough time to dedicate. Yeah, that's why. Okay. Let's go with that. Understood. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, speaking yeah. of uh, triathlons, I, I honestly do think if, if I gave you two and a half, three weeks, that you could be ready for one. How's the mile? Uh, how are we doing on the mile? Good, today? good. Uh, mile, so day 1,614 was yesterday. 1,614 so. consecutive days of running at least one mile. Yeah. That's that woman right so, there. So the running is good. Um, biking, I think I'd be okay. Swimming is where I would really Not struggle. Not a strong swimmer. Not Well, I, I just... I haven't done it a lot. You know, I did it as a kid. Like I was not super competitive swimmer, but uh, but it's just not something you routinely do. Like as an adult, Strong I don't think, swimmer? unless you're very intentional about oh. it. Right? Awful swimmer. Could yeah. you survive? I could. I could. Yeah. I'm. I'm really bad at like. I'm gonna like. I'm almost like a ping pong ball where I'm bouncing between the buoys. You know, like I'm not a good straight line. Right. right. You know what I mean? I kind of veer off. Is that so. <gasps> No, I mean, or? I can no, I can get it down. I just, I'm not very, I'm not straightforward. I'm going to kind of, you know. Okay, well, so. this for another, and this time of year where we're, we are talking about stuff off of the football field, but I just need to say this again, like the Titanic uh, question that we had, not question, but conversation that we had, it still ticks me off, James Cameron. I, I, I talk about that because of the amount of room that was on that freaking door <laughs> when Rose is out there, and then to watch Leo DiCaprio's Jack just go, fade into the water mm. horse crap i'm just calling it out it's horse crap i don't care stick one hand up on the side of the thing you'll float bro i mean don't yeah. let go i'm sorry to get on this tangent or okay, but when to you have died of hypothermia then i well, why was she fine then was she yeah she was floating on the door well bro it's, could you I, have just stacked on top of one another like a thank sandwich you. i mean it was not a queen size bed but at least it was a single i mean it's a freaking door we're talking about here yeah, anyway, I'm sorry about that. that. I know we're really here for football time. and stuff. Yeah. Now. Let's relitigate the no, no, no. no. Let's relitigate the Titanic. Well, I'm in. It, 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 I, I do. I want to write a letter. Actually, I don't know if anyone will get it right. Tersely now, worded email. Hey, get it's it done. a fun fact filled show. Okay, because we are going to get to football. But something that I just found out, and JJ, um, this woman and her husband, this our lovely friend Lara <laughs> Overton, owns a 1974. Austrian made military vehicle. Am I saying that correct? What's the name of it? It's a Pinsgauer. It's a Pinsgauer <laughs> that it absolutely looks like you are invading a country. <laughs> when, yes, it does. Okay, no, no, when no, no, it's no, no, no. street legal and it's a military vehicle. So the video that Lara just showed us, <laughs> yes. which we should insert on the podcast. Uh, Th- that thing, that thing, it looks like you're gunning it, and it's maybe going 15. <laughs> but still, would you? How are you going to invade a country with? Yeah, it? yeah what just, are you yeah. talking about? It'll go straight through a forest. <laughs> Did you see the vehicle? It's like armored and no. So six what it So this has been a a passion project of my husband's for years that he has wanted to get this vehicle. Um, and the back of it is bench seating, and you can fold them down, and you can camp in it. So uh, yeah. So we're not okay, planning nice. to raid territory. It's more <laughs> just so like you know. So, so you could camp in it and do all those different things. Yeah, but well, okay, you show up to a campsite and all the spots are taken, but you show up in that thing, you're getting a spot. Oh, yeah, people are moving <laughs> their yeah. trailers out yeah. of there. Right. But it's great. Like, all of our friends, like, who have kids, like, we'll drive it to their house and kids, like, play in it. They love climbing around in it. They think it's so cool, right? Yeah. So it's just uh, Hey, any room for your 200-pound dog? 
Of course. Is there? Of course. I, I just think he'd be a little unsteady there in the back, you know. But, L- little bit. but yeah, the things there's you, plenty hey, of room. The more you know. Anyway, at Lara Overton, <laughs> at JJ Snake. This is not what you came I'm at Hey Gordon. The reason I'm getting this out there on Twitter X, and I'm going to do this a couple times, is we need you. We want you. We want to hear what you have to say. Write us to any sort of story. Don't dog cuss me. I, that happens a lot. I get a lot of dog cussing Do going on this stuff. You don't have to if you want to. Go ahead. But questions for JJ, questions for me, questions for Lara. Again, at Lara Overton, at JJ Stankovitz. I'm at Hey Gordon, Hey Gorman, because next week we're going to go through the list. Yeah. People want to know. Fans want to know. We're going to try and answer all the questions. So that is what's coming next up. Week. The mailbag. Or, or a female bag. Yes, or a female Lara bag. Lara made that joke yesterday, and I laughed out loud. I <laughs> don't. And I had to think about it because I was like, wait a minute. I wasn't being a sexist. I was just like, the words didn't sound right to me. <laughs> Female bag. Like, I was like, but yeah, we're going to have the mailbag. I've and- gotten JJ on some good ones this week. I've yeah. just been firing all you cylinders. Well, yeah, but before we started recording, I was you literally had me cry. <laughs> oh, my God. Here. Which may uh, have involved uh, Easter celebration. Yeah. Easter celebration. At a local establishment <laughs> that the Paraguay wasn't driven to. What's it called? The Paraguay. <laughs> Whatever it's called, the, par- the, the 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 death vehicle that your husband owns, <laughs> it literally Scout. is. It's in a Rob Scout. Zombie film, is what it is. That vehicle. Anyway, uh, Twin Peaks. Anyways, mailbag episode next week. Drop a <laughs> drop a comment on YouTube too on the, on the YouTube comments. We'll yes, answer. absolutely. Drop a comment. Drop a question. Find out about these. Do you want more socks answered? Socks questions? They're right here. JJ Stankovitz, at Lara Overton, one of the most interesting ladies we know in Indianapolis, <laughs> and by the way, who's going to talk about a crosstown rival at the end of this podcast, so be ready for that a little bit. We need to give a lo- some love to the Golden Black. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. We, we need oh, to do yeah, that. No so question. I, well, while I was gone, I saw the comments about why, you know, why are you talking about Indiana before you're right, talking about right. Purdue. It right. was purely because the IU women had played the night before we recorded the podcast, so it was right. just very timely. And also, like, Purdue was a one seed. It was like, okay, they're doing what they do. This was just a little bit more like, oh, I, IU women just had played the we'll night before. We did not mean to dismiss a little basketball the later boilers. on the show because it is a great story that's coming up right here. But let's slow it down a minute. We, uh, I want to have some laughs on this show like we usually do, but we have to slow it down for a second because we won't. We lost one of our own recently, and Colts fans from long before and even new Colts fans, you know the name Vontae Davis, a cornerback that played uh, over five years here, played for Pagano and was uh, acquired in a trade. Uh, came over for the Daltons. Uh, Grigson sent a second-round pick to him, and he really was that shutdown type of a corner guy. His brother is Vernon Davis, a great tight end for a lot of years in San Francisco, comes from a football family, died unexpectedly, and what I wanted to just get off my chest really quick is – uh, the fun, the joy, the smile that he had in the locker room when we were doing media sessions with him. He was always a fun, fun interview because you never knew, really knew what he was going to say. And I mean that in a good way because he wasn't the most friendliest around press, meaning I don't want to talk every day to press. But when I do, Lara, I just want to go over with you some of the memories you had of Vontae Davis. So, you know, so many people, you were seeing the tweets about what a great player he was and certainly, but on from my perspective I was covering the team working for the local affiliate at the time and had a number of opportunities to be around Vonte and interview Vonte and he was just such a ray of light all the time always smiling always so positive always brought such immense gratitude into each and every day to be in the position of playing in the NFL and living out his dream and he did so much off the field for local kids and local families, especially in the foster care system. Mm -hmm. He had an annual shopping event when he would take kids out over the holidays to do this. And um, there's a piece that's out on Colt's social media right now in uh, where he brought a foster child into the complex and they had a day together that he spent with him and gave him a custom jersey and really took time to share his story. And I think that's one of the really impactful things about Vontae's legacy is that when he would do these events, he didn't just show up. He would talk to the kids about his background and the situation, the circumstance that he came from, where he and his siblings were going to go into foster care, but then were taken in by their grandmother. They came from a family that dealt with <clears throat> addiction issues and, and all of that. So their grandmother took them in, all six kids, and raised them single-handedly. And just so he took every opportunity he could to share his story and and use his platform to try to inspire all of the, you know, the next generation and just give them someone who they could look up to and see a bit of themselves in him and find the success and just be inspired by all of that he was able to do. And he just didn't take anything, you know, for granted. And I always did have, you know, such a great time 
in those conversations with him. But, you know, truthfully, just as great of a player as he was, an even greater, greater human. And you can see that when you look back through all of the events that he did and all of those kids who he took and was very intentional in the time that he spent making sure to impact the, the youth of Central Indiana. In the community. And, J.J., I know that you've been a football fan for a long time, but uh, – <laughs> one of the biggest things that I think people will remember, and I take off my hat and tip of the hat to Vontae Davis for this. He's playing up in Buffalo, goes into mm-hmm. halftime, and some say, oh, you quit on your teammates and you did this. He left at halftime because his body and his mind spoke to him, and it said, I'm not here. Yeah, I'm not giving 100% to this thing to get through, even in the second half of this, and literally walked off the field, gave a salute to the game, and that was it. Yeah, uh, ESPN had a, a really good – feature story on him a couple years back where they, they got into that and you read it and you really actually respect why mm-hmm. he did it. And you know, it, it wasn't just that, Hey, he quit on his team right. and all that. It was that he realized I can't do this anymore. And you know, it, it, in it, you know, it's like he calls his wife and he says, I'm coming home. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, it, it's such a sad thing, you know, to, to learn about that oh, yesterday. And, gone t- way too uh, soon, you know, man. 35. I mean, I'm 35. That, that's just it's it's really heartbreaking, um, you know. And you know, hopefully he's he's a guy people are gonna and people will remember Vontae Davis for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. You know? yeah. And uh, obviously Jim Irsay had some things to say about him. The Colts organization put out a statement for him, uh, how he was acquired. We know that from the Hard Knocks film that was saying, "Hey, we're sending you to the Colts," and you know he didn't know cameras were on him, and he said, "Well, I got to call my grandma on this one." You know, it was like. It was such a sweet-hearted, sweet, tender moment, that is. And then to watch this man play football the way that he did, you know, shut down corner, pro bowler, all that stuff like this. But, again, gone way too soon. So I want to, um, you know, on behalf of Lara and J.J. and the Colts, obviously extend even more uh, thoughts and prayers and hopefully that this hard time that uh, the family can get through this thing and make some sense of it in the upcoming week. So onward we go. We, uh, we, got, we got a bit to talk about that. I'm I'm happy for you on this thing because I I know background of the story about um, the 1984 season yeah. of the Colts taking off from Baltimore and moving into this place in Indianapolis. But the months and the weeks that were prior to this with Mr. Ursay, that's not Jim Ursay, that's his dad, Robert Ursay. Is where's this team gonna go? They they needed a new stadium in Baltimore and they weren't getting the funding behind it. So he's talking to Arizona and then Indianapolis comes out of the blue. But JJ, you're gonna do a story. It's gonna be released when uh, early summer, yeah. midsummer, uh, midsummer. And, and talk about that move and the stories behind it. And I want you to touch on this because one of our longtime, and I mean longtime equipment managers, John Scott, who now works for Mr. Ursay mm-hmm. in his artifacts, if you will, the great collection that Jim has, uh, John kind of oversees that and is a historian for this football team. You had a chance to catch up with him, yeah. and some of those stories are unbelievable. So for the, 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 the project is it's a, pod, like a narrative podcast series. Like if you listen to what Zach Kiefer did with the Andrew Luck mm-hmm. podcast, similar in that, that vein, right, where you're kind of telling a story. Uh, over a number of episodes. So I've been diving into this, doing a ton of interviews for it, a bunch of research uh, with a lot of help from Casey Vallier, Amber Darrow, Matt Taylor here. Um, and it's the, the stories that I'm getting out of it are just fascinating. Like how close the Colts came to moving to Phoenix mm-hmm. in 1984. Like it was pretty close, like really close. Uh, you know, and just the, the story, of, like the, the Colts moving from Baltimore is – I think it's a different story than when other teams have moved. When you think of, you know, franchises moving, it's because fan support had declined so much and they weren't really, no one really cared about them anymore. And in Baltimore, fan support did decline, but, like, the people who are Colts fans in Baltimore still, like, they really held on to it. And the, the story of loss, the story of gain for Baltimore and Indianapolis, I think is really fascinating to tell. And then the story of how it all happened, like, I think everyone knows the story, right, of the Mayflower truck showing up sure. and moving the team overnight. But I, I, I didn't know the story of how that really happened and why it happened and why Indianapolis became a city that could be an <coughs> NFL city. Um, so it's a four-part four part series that will come out kind of before after the 4th of July. Uh, in uh, right here on the Colts Audio Network. Well, you're in the heart of this thing format. right now. I know yeah. you're right in the middle but of it. 
So what, what we're teeing up here is a little, just a little tease, a little taste. A little bit of a tease. I mean, fun stories that you're going to find out about getting out of the complex for some people mm-hmm. named Ursay at the time and stuff. I'm not going to do any spoiling on this. but Rick we'll, Venturi yeah, has Rick, a role Rick, in Rick, this. Rick, Rick, the great Rick Venturi. Stories. Yes, yep. absolutely. But it's, uh, it's fascinating what happened many, many years ago to watch that this franchise now has its foundation and its roots here in Indianapolis, but coming over from Baltimore. And there's a long extended story that you're going to hear in July from this guy. But as JJ was just saying, here's a little sneak peek behind the curtain. This is from the Colts move from Baltimore to Indianapolis. Here he is with John Scott. What hits me more instead of the 28th is the 27th. I lived at an apartment called Morningside Heights where a lot of the players lived and it overlooked the complex. So I was that close. So that was a Tuesday and about 10 o'clock at night, I get a telephone call. Pick it up, and I recognize the voice right away. It's Jim Ursay. Johnny, it's Jim Talks, you know. I just talked to my dad. We're moving. It's 27th at night. I go, oh, my gosh. I said, when? He said, tomorrow. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Then I said, Phoenix? Fingers crossed. (laughs) And there's a long pause. He goes, no, Indy. And then he told me, hey, you got to keep this quiet. You can't tell any of the staff working with the Colts. You can't tell your friends. You got to keep it quiet from your family. I'm going, oh my gosh, what is going on? And it was, you know, didn't know at the time the, the state of Maryland, city of Baltimore, they're trying to get the team through eminent domain. So that was the whole idea of keeping everything quiet. So after hanging up with Jim, I'm thinking, my gosh, do I go over there now and start working? Um, but I set my alarm for four in the morning. And I'm two minutes from there. I know no, no one's going to be over there. And immediately started boxing up, you know, the player's equipment. And then it was so surreal as I'm doing it, packing the uniforms up. I'm going, I wonder if the colors are going to change. I wonder if the name is going to change. All these things going through my head as I'm packing it up. And still, am I going to pinch myself? Am I, am I dreaming this thing? At about 8 o'clock, the Mayflower trucks started rolling in. So it's like going to happen. And I had gotten a big jump on my stuff, but it was by myself. Did I get it all done? Oh, heck no. And um, so the trucks are pulling up. Then a bus pulls up and it's all these workers hired that night or the day before to come in. And then they started taking a lot of the boxes that I had going on the Mayflower trucks. So I'm kind of watching these guys. And then about an hour later, I noticed watching these guys, and they had coats on. It was a rainy, snowy night. And underneath their jackets was half zipped. I could see Baltimore across here. But I'd heard earlier that these guys came from Washington, D.C. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, these guys are Redskin fans. Why do they have, and I know where I'm going with this, they would go in the back parts of these rooms, put on a jersey, put on a Colts shirt or hat, whatever, put their jacket back on and then walk out. And then they, they were ripping us off, you know. And these guys were gaining weight too, you know. I look at it and say, God, that guy looked like he was 190 pounds. Now he's 240, you know. He's like the Michelin man. So I got with the guy in charge. I said, hey, you know, something's going on here. You know, whatever it is, you, you need to get with those people. He goes, okay, I get it, I get it. Give me 15 minutes. So went 15 minutes back in the equipment room. Went back in the locker room. There's a mountain of stuff. There's footballs, jerseys, hats, all in this big pile, you know, that these guys had taken from. I'm sure they got off with some, but, um, yeah, that was eye-opener for sure. I've heard they whine that they were robbing you guys of the wine. Yeah, and that's how they were doing it. <laughs> so, so how late did you work that night? Um, about three o'clock. Uh, Jimmy came down and wanted to see the progress of everything down there, and I uh, was checking out. I was looking at the training room. Came back in the equipment room. He said, "Hey," he said, uh, "Just to let you know, you and I are flying to Indianapolis or in a couple of hours." I'm thinking, okay, all right. He goes, we got to get some sleep. Are you almost done here? I said, yeah. He goes, I, I can't, I can't go home because there's been death threats on my family, everything else. I said, well, wait a minute, we'll just go to my apartment. He goes, yeah, but you're gonna have to sneak me out of here. 
I said, well, okay, we can do that. So we went in my car. I'm driving. Jim's in the passenger side. I have this big blank in the back. I throw it over him. Now, as we're going out, of course, there's a lot of news people, and they got their cameras and everything, and I'm pulling up. You know, they're stopping me and taking pictures. I roll down the window. I say, hey, can I help you? Oh, that's John. He's got the equipment guy. Yeah, come on through, you know. So I went there, and Jim's hiding underneath there. And then we go to spend the night at my apartment about four hours, and then we flew out of um, D.C., and we didn't fly out of Baltimore, and then um, came here in Jim's dad's um, jet to Indianapolis. That is fascinating. The story is fascinating. I, I just want to sprinkle a little something on top of that story is uh, the Colts went to Baltimore, and I'm going to say it's – we'll have to look it up – 2004, 2005, for the first time that the Indianapolis Colts went in to mm. play the Baltimore Ravens. And uh, I just remember Mr. Ursay the, – the, the words of Mr. Ursay ringing in my head is, um, we got to have security everywhere. You know, we got to have security for the, my family. we got to mm. have security for me and everything like – and and it wasn't as bad as you would have thought. It, the more of the venom was directed at Robert Ursay, sure. not so much the son Jim Ursay. Though there was some incidents, a lot of you know, gr- you know, one finger, middle finger salutes, and yeah. hey, this, that, you Ursay, and stuff like that. But the Colts have went back there many times before, and it seems like the community of Baltimore isn't teed off at, at they're, Jim they're Ursay. Not. It's it's more of a hey we understand you were yeah. doing what your dad you as know? as I've learned from talking to people in Baltimore mm-hmm. for this every single one of them has just been like oh we and they all call him Jimmy mm-hmm. we just right. we love Jimmy right Jimmy right. was great he was a member of the community yeah he was you know someone who was around John Zeman who uh, he's the the leader of the Marching Ravens previously yeah. he was the yeah. leader of the the, the Colt marching band. He was featured in um, there was the band a, that wouldn't die the ESPN the 30, 30 for 30. thirty yeah but so I I remember talk I, I was just talking to him yesterday. And he told me the story of the, that, that first time that the Colts are back in Baltimore. He's down on the field, and he hears someone yell at him, hey, why didn't you say hi to me? And he turns around, and it, it's Jimmy Ursay. So you go, and, you know, uh, John Zeman goes up to, to Ursay and says, you know, we had a dinner date on March 29th, 1984, wow. and you didn't show up. Wow. And Jim, Jim Ursay goes, yeah, I was out of town. <laughs> <laughs> like just, and you know, then they, you know, they had a nice little chat about their families. And right, stuff, right, and right. Sent like That's autographed great. pictures and everything. Like the 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 people of Baltimore love their community, mm-hmm. and if you were a member of that community, like Mister Ursay was, um, you know, they, they'll love you back. Absolutely. And, and it's it's been a really neat thing to kind of learn about Baltimore, learn the history of Baltimore, learn the history of Indianapolis. Yeah. Um, something that was put to me in this project was think about like. Indianapolis and Louisville, and Larry, you obviously know Louisville very yeah. well. Um, how both of them were sort of similar cities in the 1960s. They had a big college basketball program, Kentucky, Indiana. They had one big event every year, the Derby, the 500. And population wise, they, they're about the same. Really? ABA, they, they both had, they both ABA, had an ABA team, the that Kentucky was the Colonels, the Pacers and yeah. The Colonels. Uh, and Indianapolis invested in their sports infrastructure, and Louisville didn't. And look at where they are now. Indianapolis is a big city. Yeah. And Louisville's kind of, yeah, it's a nice town. Got some good stuff to do, but they don't have an NFL team. Wow. Sure. Funny you how know, that landscape changed. Like, yeah. That mean, is like true. That. Very, very true. And, you know, it, there are a lot of, still a lot of similarities, but the big thing that separates them is the professional sports. And there have been a lot of campaigns to try to draw something, you know, to Louisville if they could, you know, expand greater, you know, whatever it, it might be. And that's just never been able to happen. There hasn't been the support for it because I think that so many people have already established those professional affiliations with teams in Indy or, you know, for a while it was St. Louis or it's Nashville yeah, right. or it's Cincinnati. Yeah. You have too many other professional sports yeah areas in that circumference that people are already drawn and kind of committed to. It's By the difficult. Way, that, this whole, like, I'm so excited about this because the stuff I'm learning is just fascinating. Like, yeah. The Pacers are a huge part of this story that they were very unstable in the seventies when they made the move from the ABA to the NBA. And there, there was pretty significant talk about, you know, the Pacers might leave Indianapolis. Yeah. Wow. And if the Slick Pacers, Leonard, Slick and Nancy had a whole telethon. The telethon hosted yes. by the late, great Chet Kopic, by the way. Oh, uh, of course if anyone, it was. If anyone knows Chet Kopic, yeah. rest his soul, he was, he was, a, he was a character. Yeah. Uh, but if they didn't sell 8,000 season tickets at that telethon, there's a really good chance that their ownership would have just 
okay, they're not viable here. Let's move them out west. Wow. And if they had done that in the 1970s, all the momentum that Indianapolis had been building toward, hey, we're going to be a sports town, a sports tourism destination, the amateur sports capital of the world, that would have <laughs> fell off. Mm-hmm. There never, never would have been momentum to build the Hoosier Dome, and we wouldn't be sitting here right now in this studio. Incredible. Yeah. We're talking about the Colts in Indianapolis. So many, so many stories like that. Anyway, around July, don't forget a behind the scenes look at the move from Baltimore to Indianapolis and the characters that you normally don't hear from. That's what I like about this. You're digging deep on this stuff. So it's going to be an incredible uh, four part series coming up in July. I know that's down the road, but look at it. Well, so, one thing t- the people you normally don't hear from, I remember my first season with the Colts, 2019, we did this kind of behind the scenes type of deal with the equipment staff. And it was pulling teeth to get John Scott to talk about just, you know, the logistics of the equipment operations. Yeah. So it's so funny, you know, because like John is just absolutely adore him. And he is such an institution of this organization. But in five years, how far we've come that yeah, now right. he's one of the <laughs> leading voices of, of the podcast. And certainly one of those who's critical to telling that story because he's one of a handful of people that made that move from Baltimore yeah. alongside Pete Ward, alongside Rick Venturi, a couple. Of, you know, a few players as well. Fuzz uh, back in the video right, department fuzzy, as well. Yeah. So, yeah. That would be great. Anyway, it's coming out again in July. Look for that. And we will touch upon that because I know you're going to find out some more stuff that you can't keep to yourself because we're going to have to <laughs> share it a little bit on this show. Okay, let's go to current football status right now. And I'm reading a lot on the Internet. And I'm reading on the social media. I'm going to start with JJ. JJ, why are the Indianapolis Colts so boring? <laughs> that's what I'm getting. That's uh-huh. not from me. That's not from me. But you're hearing a lot of people this time of year. And, Lara, I can't wait to get your thoughts on this. Ah, the Colts are boring. We hear about these big-time free agents that are out there. They're going to sign them. My sources say they're coming in. But when you look at what happened so far with this offseason for Chris Ballard, it's been pretty vanilla, which is not a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, the, when I was at the, the league meetings last week, you know, you, you see people from other organizations who cover or other organizations. Hey, how's your offseason going? You know, you talk to people from, uh, you know, the, the Chargers, and it's like, whew, we're like drinking through a fire hose. We got Jim Harbaugh here. Yeah, right. You know, we, we you know, traded Keenan Allen, all this stuff. Jim Harbaugh living in a, like, an RV, by the way. Did yeah, you hear that little story? Why, why didn't they sign Gardner Minshew? <laughs> I, mean, well, I know why. They have Justin ah, Herbert. But, I get like, it. You know, but you talk, you know, yeah. all my friends who cover the Bears, it's yeah. just like stadium stuff. Uh, number one overall pick. Like, they're just, you know, they're all Justin frazzled. Fields traded, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. And I'm sitting here being like, got the 15th overall pick, made some prudent moves in free agency, and the big thing that matters is, is you know, Anthony Richardson going to be able to have a healthy season? Eh, there's really not a whole lot going on with the Colts right now, but that's fine. Like, the, you, you don't want to be that team necessarily that everyone's talking about in March. That doesn't really matter. You want to be the team that everyone's talking about in November, December, January. That's where and, – and that's where the Colts are building toward. You're not trying to go out and, you know, spend a bunch of money on a player who, you know, you, what's the, the Chris Ballard line that I know everyone hates, but you don't want to pay uh, B-plus players A-plus money, sure. right? You know, that's what you're doing in free agency. But to retain your, the guys who deserve to be retained – and to make a couple little you know, moves here on the periphery of your roster and then sit there with the 15th overall pick and add talent at 15, at 46, at 82, um, that's a, not a bad <laughs> place like Jay, to be. Jay just calling out Powerball numbers. <laughs> 15, 82. <laughs> like, that's what I felt like. 82 is not a Powerball number. I don't know. Lara, you were on. just like, I don't know. It's just funny. You're rattling them off. Yeah. I have a lot of thoughts on this. And, you know, a few things um, – First and foremost, boring is good because when was the last offseason there wasn't turnover either from a coaching position, from a quarterback position, or, you know, glaring concerns about the status of your quarterback. Really good point. So I think that everyone kind of – this is a good thing. We haven't been in this position for a while, so let's think about that. The other thing to me that is easy to overlook – When you say the Colts are boring, that argument is because they haven't brought in a ton of new players. There have been some, right? Raekwon Davis being among them. Joe Flacco, who we talked with, of course, when he was in. But the majority so far of the spending has been in investing in your own. What does that mean? Well, it means that the Colts drafted well. Like, it means that you did a good job in the initial wave of acquiring players so that you have 
obviously gotten the most out of them on rookie deals and you now have solidified and you know the guys who you have, isn't it better to have guys who you know and you know their trajectory and you have seen what they're like in the trenches, you've seen what they're like through adversity, they've seen the highs and the lows, rather than going out and being like, hey, we know that this guy performed really well for insert team X. We don't know what he's going to be like in our locker room, we don't know the circumstances that led him to be successful there. Maybe he was successful because of the scheme he was in. Maybe he was successful because of other factors, not just isolated to him and his unique talent, skill set, production, all of those things. So that's the other thing to me is that so much of the excitement in this offseason should be like, Dang, we got it right with all these guys, with Pittman, with Grover Stewart, with Tyquan, with Zaire, with Rigo. Who am I leaving off here? I mean, Kenny Moore. Kenny Moore. Grover you know, Stewart. not that he was a draft pick, but he was a guy you acquired. But, and, and you, you know, developed those guys. And, and it's not even like it, like Pittman was the draft pick, but those other guys are third contract guys, mm -hmm. which like to have that many guys, you're like, we want to keep those guys here on a third contract. That's even more rare. And, and also, I just think, too, Shane Steichen has earned a bit of continuity to this point. Allow him to now go into a second season where he knows 90% of the roster is the same. You know, I, I don't know the exact the, you know, right. factor on it, but let's just kind of call it that from what – Rather than last year when it was build a new staff, right, draft a quarterback, right. let's throw a dart at the dartboard, see if we get who we want. Now you have, all right, another year with this entire coaching staff for the most part, a couple of new additions here and there, of course, um, within uh, obviously the defensive side, Alex Tanya on the offensive side, but you know who your quarterback is, you know who your weapons are going to be offensively, you know your entire offensive line, you've got the running back situation. Okay, I want to hit on that because yeah. this is something that I have been, I've been kind of like, holding in a little bit that I want to get off my chest. If the Colts signed Jonathan Taylor to that extension that they signed him to in October on March 11th, we wouldn't be like, ah, Colts are boring. It'd be like, oh my gosh, look yeah. what they did. Right. But, but it's essentially the same. It's the same. It counts the same. It counts the same. It's a, an extension that kicks in in 2024. Right. So just because the Colts signed it in 2023 doesn't mean that like you can just forget about it. They paid Jonathan Taylor a lot of money. On that extension. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can't forget about it when you're looking at the Colts offseason and how they're yep. spending their money and the kind of player, what they're doing and what the plan is and the players they're bringing in and keeping. Jonathan Taylor is a big part of this. And if you just are like, oh, well, that was last year, that's not it. Yeah, it almost you almost need an asterisk by it to like be like, yeah. you know, plus like, Jonathan Taylor, by you the know. Way, that money counts for this year. Yeah. Absolutely. Listen, 28, I mean, if you're a fantasy player, play him this year. It's going to be all. But let's be real for a minute. Let's be real, not that you're not. This football team, what is it, a half? What is it, a quarter away from being a playoff team with a oh. with a journeyman quarterback? I'm talking about a guy that they got off off the street and I'm no disrespect to Gardner, but I'm saying people know around the league this is a backup. This is a backup. This is what the Shane Steichen did. They were a quarter of a way from making the playoffs with this team, which transitions just to what you said. How many wins now does that – more from right. Gardner to a healthy Anthony Richardson? And that's the whole thing. Keep him healthy. He's going to do what he does. Everybody on the other side of this wall has belief in him. But if that guy can stay healthy for 17 weeks – Sky is the limit. So here, here's and, where, and, and and that's what I'm. I'm right, sorry but, to get but pissed, that, but that's it. That's, that's like it. Generally. Those guys that we're talking about, Grover Stewart, find better. Petman, what do you want? Keenan Allen, find better. He knows this quarterback. Mm -hmm. He knows this city. He knows that locker room. Find better. So when it comes to being boring, it's not even close to being boring. Here's, Let's have this conversation again in October or November, for here's gosh sake. Where like I, I've seen this question of like, well, how did the Colts get better this off season? Here's how the Colts got better. Or if we get to let, – let me rephrase that. When we get to the end of January mm -hmm. and we ask ourselves, how did the Colts get better in the 2024 offseason? The answer is probably going to be Anthony Richardson at a full season. Yeah. You, there's nothing you can do in free agency. Not probably. It, it, nothing that you is. can do in free agency yeah. that's going to keep Anthony Richardson healthy yep. throughout mm -hmm. the season. Right? Like, what, you know, if for all the fans who thought we were trained for Legarius Sneed, how's that going to keep – How's that going to keep him healthy? That might make our def that might make the defense a little bit better, but then you're committing a bunch of resources to that. A lot of money. And now, okay, yep. now what? Now we can't mm -hmm. have money to re-sign Kenny Moore. To right. Restore. So just remember, and this is why it's kind of boring right now, because the thing that matters the most 
we're not going to have an answer for, for what, eight months about Anthony? So let's just... Let's Training camp, it. probably. Right, but I mean, I'm saying, yeah. like, can he stay healthy for a full season? Oh, I see what right. you're saying, yeah. Right, like, his, his health is one thing right now, obviously, getting him back, yeah. throwing, being ready to, you know, but <laughs> can he stay healthy for a full season? Because if he does, there is a lot of confidence within this organization that he is going to make everyone else around him better. And, and guys, that's how you improve. We are now less than two weeks away from guys getting back in the building for some of the voluntary work, too. Right. Like, this is coming up quickly. Um, you know, we don't... In this too, it's it's worth stating like there's very there are very limited opportunities that you have, you know, in terms of what you're able to watch or see guys do. It's a lot of conditioning stuff, a lot of running and lifting and those types of things. But we are getting very, very close to that point where you will see true, you know, OTAs and mini camp and you're going to start to see exactly what this is going to shape up to look like come late July, early August. And the leader of that locker room, I'm sorry, usually the quarterback, and I know he's a young man, but he's going to be there for those. He may mm -hmm. not be slinging it as much as he normally would coming off the rehab, but it's a big off season for but Anthony never, I Richardson. I mean, you never know. Like, we don't know right. where he's at right. like, when you get to OTAs. But you said it best. We're not going to know for seven, eight months, like in week five or week six, the first quarter of the season or however you want to put it, that he's out there and staying healthy. And if that's the case, the sky's the limit. So for all you guys out there, your keyboard general managers, mm, I'll stay boring. I don't mind boring. By the boring. way, I, I do. I do I have a, a of, I do have a bit of a beef mm -hmm. with the the term keyboard general manager, keyboard warrior. Who uses a keyboard anymore? You got one right there. I do, but like if you're if you're firing off takes, you're, it's, it's a phone. It's a phone. It's, yeah, it's, gotta it's be like still a, a keyboard you have though. A keyboard it's, on your st phone? it's still a keyboard. Yeah, but like that's not that's not how I view like think of a keyboard. I mean, yeah, there's still I mean, is a keyboard that's on still your a phone. Keyboard, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I figure a keyboard's got you got to have you know key physical keys you can punch in. Then what is this? I think we need to update that. Term, Double J, do saying. me a favor, take yeah. the L on this one, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at a keyboard on the thing. So I mean, I don't know what to say. You want to leave it to Con? I mean. Colin, what do you think? Is there a keyboard on the phone or no? <laughs> Thank you, Colin. JJ, he's out Colin of Lambo with Producer him. Colin, I love it. That one. So much to talk about. And big obviously, Dave and Buster's guy, this, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> big Dave and Buster's. We found out that's coming out. I don't know when, but the, I mean, he's a collector of authentic jerseys with authentic autographs from him because he goes in and bellies up to the bar at Dave and Buster's, and then plays a few games too. Let's hear it for Colin. Let's hear it for Colin. All right, listen up. One thing to get us excited. I feel like for Colin us. just clapped for himself. <laughs> <laughs> can can you take us out on this? More to come. Obviously, OTAs that Laura touched on and the NFL draft. What did you? What? What did I say? You said Laura. I said Lara. No. Run that back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, let's zip. <laughs> and as Lara said, OTAs are coming up. We're going to have a lot of that coverage going on and getting ready for the NFL draft. JJ, I'm starting with you on this one. Give me. One play yeah. from last year, because there were many, many. Oh, I forgot we were doing this. That you, <laughs> one play from last yeah. year that's going to get me excited about the 24 season. And the reason I want to put an example out there is Zach Moss, we love you, but he's no longer a Colt. Mm -hmm. So we're not looking for Zach Moss yeah. to type of things. So one play in your mind that gets Colts fans excited for what is to come in 2024, the season prior, the 2023 season, what play? So uh, when I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking back to what, what Shane Steichen talked about last week at the owners' meetings. Mm -hmm. There was just like this one play where Anthony Richardson threw uh, – he, like he noticed no one was covering Josh Downs mm -hmm. on a jet motion. And he just threw him the ball. He didn't even go through his production. I love that just, you're bringing bam, this up. Open. Yeah. That's not a play that you're going to like look at and be like, that gets me excited. That's but what that's I said play, to you. But that's, you know, a remember? Play, that's a play that gets Shane Steichen excited. Yeah. Where, where I think we will probably go is like a highlight, right? Of like, man, that's like that's the potential of this team. But I just wanted to get that out there that like there are little things that Anthony Richardson did last year that you're like, that's something that you as a, at, like these coaches are like, that's a great sign. And it's not the the rocket arm throw to Alec Pierce where getting wrapped up by Aaron Donald. Obviously, that's exciting. It's the he's processing stuff really well and knew he had an open receiver and right. knew that there was going to be a just large gain. Get in the ball and Boom. to get heck the with the, tr the 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 route tree up top. Mm -hmm. I'm going to this yeah. guy right out of the gate. So you brought that up to me when I said. Same thing. Right. JJ, why are we so excited about this play? When you broke it down yeah. like that, it makes sense. Larry, can I put you on the spot? Uh, uh, Exciting play from okay, 20. So let, me, let me go. The, Did the one JJ that, give an answer? Oh, oh No, okay. I didn't. That's yeah. what I was going to oh, give. Oh, I it. thought you were. That was the one that well, you that, were. Well, that, uh, that was an example just gotcha. to kind of be like, yeah, it doesn't have to be a total highlight. Um, I, I think about Jonathan Taylor's touchdown against the Texans. Mm. That was a, like, that. The, last year was a tough year for Jonathan Taylor, right? Sure. Like, you know, he, he has the surgery. He's on PUP. He's going through the contract stuff. 
you, you have to think mentally and physically last year was tough on Jonathan Taylor. And then you get to that last game, and he goes off with the playoffs on the line. And that, that touchdown run he had, yeah. that just majestic, like, you know, the, the, the C parts. At 22 just, or 23 miles an hour yeah, or whatever it was. Yeah. zooms into the end zone. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff I think you, you're looking for Jonathan Taylor to do more of that. And when you now drop number five back in there, you want right. to ask how the Colts are going to get better. How about a running game with <laughs> yeah. Anthony Richardson and Jonathan Taylor? A happy and content, uh, you, you yes. know, Jonathan as well. And a so. healthy Anthony Richardson. Yeah. You, are, you are feeling good about where that can go. And I think that was just a little sneak peek into what might be ahead there. Hello, what do you got for me? Uh, I think I keep just thinking back, and I just had to look to see when it was. It must have been the first game. Was it the first game against Jacksonville? Is that what this was? I'm looking back at it um, when he spikes it, and it was like the most epic spike, and it was like short yardage, red zone situations, Mm -hmm. the athleticism that Anthony Richardson brings, his ability to obviously make plays with his arm and with his legs, for defenses to have to account for the running threat of Anthony and JT. That's just just nuts. Just I'm thinking about that when he charges straight in the end zone, basically untouched, leaps, spikes the ball, like – Absolutely, be a lot of that coming. Absolutely ridiculous stuff. Um, so th- those are some of the situations where the Colts haven't had a quarterback with that ability um, to do those type of things. And then also, it's a lot of the improvisation that you saw from Anthony. And JJ, I know this is something that you talked with Coach Steichen about when, you know, he was, it wasn't necessarily, you know, the read as it was designed, but Anthony was able to pick up on other things and, you know, call the audible and make those adjustments that he needed to do in a number of different situations, even with that small sample size. But yeah, for me, it's like those type of situations that what, what Anthony can do short yardage, you know, red zone conversion type of situations, especially with the running threat. Yeah. The Colts are 23rd in the red zone last year. They're under 50%. Um, that's probably going to go up. I'm talking about RPOs, man. Run pass options with 28 there. Give it to them five, six, seven, eight times in a row, and all of a sudden that quarterback uh, mm-hmm. stops and keeps, and you got a 25-yard gain on third down or whatever it is. That's the sort of scenarios that I'm looking forward to. The gouge, the gouge, the gouge to gouge. Uh, pass uh, pass to score, throw to score, run to win. Yep. Going to see a lot of that out of Shane Steichen this year. All right, guys, at Lara Overton, at J.J. Stankovitz, I'm at Hey Gorman. The reason why we're bringing this up again on Twitter X, we need you and we want to hear from you. Questions. Nothing is off limits. Nothing is off. You want to talk about his sock collection? Bring it up. You want to talk about her husband, who's a serviceman <laughs> in the Austrian Army? We can what bring did, that what up. Did, well, what did you close, call it? Right? You, you called it a Paraguay earlier. Paraguay, yeah. Episode. Wasn't it? Paraguay. I'm just kidding. Dan Tucker is not in the Austrian army, but he does drive a military vehicle from Austria. What's it called? That's What's it called? Pins. Jeffrey? Paradigm. Jeffrey? Paradigm. Paradigm. This is this is like yeah. the Portillo's. Portillo's. Yeah. Is it a Portillo? Yeah, it this, a Paratello's, this is Portillo's. Yeah, it's just Here a recreational. Flies. Just a recreational it's thing. Beautiful. He's a car guy. He's and a car I, guy. I know. I love it. And by the way, you'll see you on the streets of Indianapolis sometimes. Maybe in the northeast corner on uh, some maybe, holidays. Maybe, maybe, yeah. On some, on some <laughs> maybe, on occasion. Castle's area. All right. Anything else before we cut it loose? Because we're coming back with more getting you ready for the draft. The Colts Audio Network, you guys have great podcasts leading up to the draft. You know about that as far as what's going on and getting Colts fans ready. The free agency podcast that we had, the NFL draft experts that are coming up. Colts.com, anywhere you get your podcast, you can find that also. JJ, what do you got for me as we say goodbye? Caitlin Clark's pretty good at basketball. Okay. Oh, yeah, we do have to talk Hey, about also, Final Four weekend, Purdue, mm-hmm. obviously, Boilers looking incredible. I just and said that mostly so we would talk about, about, we would talk about uh, Iowa basketball before we mentioned Purdue on the podcast. Just as a bit. I'm sorry, Purdue fans. Just, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. So, I actually kind of like the Boilers. Okay, I, I'm obviously an IU grad, mm-hmm. uh, love Indiana University, but had the incredible privilege to – cover Purdue when I was working, you know, at the local affiliate at Fox 59 and CBS 4 and spent a lot of time covering Matt Painter's team. And there are not many coaches that I have more respect for than Matt Painter with the way he constructs his program, the way he coaches, every single thing about it. So from this Hoosier, best of luck, Boilers. Hope to, you know, hope to see you guys make a run. Would love to see a national championship brought back to the state of Indiana because be certainly the way, I mean, just <laughs> you think about too, I'm going to go on a tangent here for a little bit, but like the way that Matt has run his program is it's not a lot of these transfer portal guys. It's a lot of recruiting, you know, the top in-state talent type of guys who he's gotten to West Lafayette. Obviously, Zach Eady, not a 
in-state product, but gone out and got a, a guy like Zach Eady, but Braden Smith, yeah. a Westfield guy, um, Mason Gillis, right? Just so many um, who are intern, you know, in-state guys who have come in, they've bought in, they've developed. It's you know, not, not one of these situations where he's gone and plucked a ton of guys out of the portal and taking guys from other programs. It's just, it to me is one of the um, last kind of true old school college basketball programs, if you kind of see it that way. Do you, uh, do you remember the one time that Matt Painter almost left? I don't. 2000, Missouri. 2011. Missouri. Zoo came in hot right. for Matt Painter. Yep. It was one of the last things I covered when I was still in college. Uh, Mike Anderson was the head coach there. He left for Arkansas. And Mizzou was like, we want to take a big swing. And they went hard after Matt Painter. And it was, it was getting a little dicey uh, for Purdue. But he he opted to stay at Purdue, and I've actually I've 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 always kind of liked Purdue ever since I had a really chance encounter with Robbie Hummel on my honeymoon. Oh yeah, oh uh, we were on the same Robbie's tour. Robbie's awesome. Oh uh, yeah, it was great. We were on the same tour of Cinque Terre in Italy, and I had a really fun talk with Robbie Hummel about when Matt Painter almost left, and he's like, "No offense, but why are you making a move to a, a, a it's a lateral mm-hmm. move?" Right, right, right. I was like, "Oh, don't take it." Like I know I know Mizzou basketball well enough. Um, but ever since then, I've always, always kind of like Purdue because Robbie Hummel, really good dude. Hey, pr- really is this, good dude. so, so is, many. Is this new so Purdue? Many. It is that new? Is that can I can, can that be mine? I mean, we got two games left. Just say boiler up. Boiler up. There you go. Purdue it anyway. If you got the best player in college basketball on your team for the last two years in Zach Eady, it's kind of fun watching him going. You said it best. Let's bring a national championship back here to the heartland in Indianapolis. That's going to do it for the official Colts podcast. Lara, anything on the way out? Uh, you know, just a lot of behind the Colts work going on, a lot Great of pre-draft stuff. Yeah. stuff going on. We'll have a local pro day coming up here soon, and then guys get back in the building. So we're going to try to ramp things up around here. Anything that you want available on Also, everybody get ready for the Eclipse next Monday. That's right. Yeah, next Monday, the Eclipse. The eclipse. Yeah. That's coming. No, uh, yeah, a lot of people that are that are brokering for goggles right now. So I bought 10 of them off of, uh, off of a website. And I'm gonna start selling them for like six bucks. Better each. make sure that they're the right ones, though. Ah, who cares? I, I just uh, gotta make a profit. <laughs> might, might mess up. Colin's gonna get his at David Buster's. He's got tickets. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's fun. All right, that's another show coming up. The Dave and Buster's holiday uh, extravaganza <laughs> with our own Colin. Anyway, uh, for Lara Overton, JJ Stankovitz, I'm Jeffrey Gorman. One more time at JJ Stankovitz at Lara Overton. Mailbag next week. I'm at Hey Gorman. We need your mailbag questions sent in. We will talk to you then. Enjoy the final four this weekend. Boiler up.